This is everything you need for cardiac meds. But before we get started, recently a student asked me how much they should study for med surge. So I showed them this. <laughs> I'm just playing guys. You can totally pass med surge if you study around 30 to 40 hours a week. All right, let's get started on antiplatelets. So the purpose of antiplatelets is actually just to stop platelets from sticking to each other. The other name for this is called platelet aggregation. That means platelets sticking to each other. Now, aspirin is used during a MI, myocardial infarction, to stop the a clot from getting worse. The side effects of aspirin and clopidogrel is stomach ulcers and bleeding. So not only is the patient at risk for bleeding, but they're also at risk for GI bleed if the ulcer erodes enough. The last thing you need to know about aspirin and clopidogrel is to tell the patient to stop them before surgery. That way they don't bleed out during the surgery. All right, so now we're moving on to thrombolytic therapy. Thrombolytic therapy are essentially meds that dissolve clots. Sometimes they're called clot busters. The name of these drugs is called tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. The other name could be streptokinase or altapase. Note how they all end in ASE. So because these drugs are really, really good at dissolving all clots in the body, the patient's really high risk for bleeding. So now there's one area that we're really concerned about bleeding and that's in the brain. If you see a patient have decreased level of consciousness, meaning they're lethargic, confused, restless, agitated, that's what decreased level of consciousness means. You wanna hold the TPA, you wanna hold the streptokinase or altapase. Aside from this, the only other side effect the patient can get is dysrhythmias, such as VTAC. The next thing you need to know is, how do you know if the TPA worked? How do you know the clot got dissolved? The answer to that is, there's no more chest pain. If there is still chest pain, call the doctor. There's several contraindications to thrombolytic therapy. Contraindications means patients who cannot receive these meds. So these contraindications include recent surgery within three weeks, actively bleeding, a recent stroke or head injury within the last three months, hypertension above 180 over 110, or if they've had a STEMI that's lasted more than 12 hours. So thrombolytic therapy really only works within 12 hours since the chest pain began. All right, so now you need to know some nursing interventions to stop all these patients that are on antiplatelets and thrombolytic therapies and other anticoagulants from bleeding. This is called bleeding precautions. And there's actually a mnemonic that you can use to help you identify what they are. It's called RANDI. So RANDI stands for razors have to be electric, avoid anything rectal like enema suppositories, no NSAIDs like aspirin or ibuprofen because these can also cause bleeding. You want to decrease the amount of needles that you use on the patients like IMs or sub-Qs or IV insertions, and you want to protect the patient from injury. The last thing you need to know is that Randy needs a soft bristle toothbrush. So a soft bristle toothbrush will prevent the gums from bleeding. So the next drug we're going to talk about is called heparin. Heparin is also used to prevent clots. It can be given sub-Q or IV. It doesn't dissolve clots like thrombolytic therapy does. You need to know that the lab that we use to trend heparin is called APTT. The normal level is 28 to 35, but the therapeutic level is 42 to 87. Therapeutic means people on heparin. So people not on heparin should be 28 to 35. People on heparin should be 42 to 87. If it's more than 87, the patient's at risk for bleeding. If it's under 42, that means the hep it's not enough heparin. Now the antidote in case too much heparin is given is called protamine sulfate. This is for heparin induced thrombocytopenia. This means too much heparin, so much that the platelets have gone down under 150. Normal platelet count is 150 to 400,000. Other anticoagulants include enoxaparin and fundaparinex. All right, so now we're done covering anticoagulants. Now we're moving on to cholesterol lowering drugs. Now there's some rules that you need to know before uh, we get started on the drugs. The first one is that all cholesterol drugs cause hepatotoxicity. That means damage to the liver. Now how do we know the liver is getting damaged? We monitor liver function tests, also called LFTs. Liver function tests are two tests, two labs that we see to see how well the liver, liver is doing. One of them is ALT, the other one's AST. And if these are elevated, it means the liver is damaged. The first class of cholesterol-lowering drugs are called statins, such as atorvastatin and simvastatin. 
The side effect of these meds is called rhabdomyolysis. This is a breakdown of skeletal muscle, which causes myoglobin to go into the bloodstream, and that myoglobin is actually going to damage the kidneys. So what we see the patient have is bloody urine. So essentially what you have to do is if your patient is complaining of dark urine, sometimes referred to as cola-colored urine, and they're complaining of muscle pain, you need to report this to the doctor. The last thing you need to know about statins is to teach your patients to take these at night with food. The next class of drugs that lowers cholesterol is actually a vitamin. It's called niacin. The other name is nicotinic acid, vitamin B3, and vitamin PP. The side effect of this is going to be flushing and pruritus, and this is how that looks. You can't see the pruritus, but trust me, that patient is itchy. You have to teach the patient to take aspirin or NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, 30 minutes before they take the niacin. This is to prevent the flushing and the pruritus. The next category of cholesterol-lowering drugs are called fibric acid derivatives, and this is going to be phenofibrate. The only side effect for this is upset stomach. Then we have bioacid sequestrants. This is going to be cholesteramine and cholecevolum. Look how they both start with choli. This, these drugs aren't used that often anymore, and this is because they interfere with other drugs, and they interfere with vitamins A, D, E, and K absorption. The last drug you need to know that lowers cholesterol is called ecetamide. All right, so now we're going to talk about antihypertensives. So now there's some rules that you need to know for all of these antihypertensive drugs. This is never stop taking a med abruptly. That can be applied to any drug. Never double up if missed dose. And that all blood pressure meds cause erectile dysfunction. One of the priorities to teach with blood pressure meds is to sit on the side of the bed before getting up. Now this is because of orthostatic hypotension. All of these drugs can cause a decrease in blood pressure. And we know that if blood pressure drops, then the patient gets dizzy and can fall. The other thing you need to know is when do you hold these drugs? You hold these drugs when blood pressure is below 90 over 60 or a heart rate is below 60. The next thing you need to know is how do you know that these drugs are working? The patient doesn't have any hypertension, so their blood pressure is below 130 over 80. So now that we're done talking about the rules that apply to blood pressure drugs, let's talk about the first one, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is used as a vasodilator, and that means it dilates the vessels in the body. Now, because it dilates the vessels in the body, all the blood will start flowing to the rest of the body instead of the heart. And I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, why would we want the heart to get less blood? Well, if the heart gets less blood and the blood is being sent to the extremities and the other organs and everywhere else, then the heart has to work less. This is called decreasing cardiac workload. So because the heart has to work less, it also consumes less oxygen and then there's less tissue damage. And this is how nitro is used for MIs. Now, aside from lowering blood pressure, which all these antihypertensives do, the side effect is going to be headache. Now, you don't want to stop nitro if the patient has a headache when they're having an MI. Instead, you want to give acetaminophen or Tylenol. The next thing you need to know about nitro is the teaching you have to do for the patient. You have to tell them not to combine nitro with sildenafil or tadalafil. Now, sildenafil, the brand name for that is called Viagra. So tadalafil, the brand name for that is called Cialis. The next thing you need to teach them is where to store the nitro. You're supposed to store it in a dark and dry place. So tell them to store it in a dark or brown bottle or cabinet, but not the bathroom because there's moisture in the bathroom. Now, one of the most important things to teach them is how to take the nitro. The first thing they do is sit down. This is because that reduces cardiac workload by reducing the amount of oxygen the heart needs. The second thing you want to do is take one tablet every five minutes up to three times. Now, if the first tablet did not stop the chest pain, that's when the patient calls 911. Because the nitro is taken sublingual, meaning it's put under the tongue, sometimes patients say it tingles or tastes bitter, and this is a good sign that the nitro is not expired. The last thing you need to know is to take off the nitro patch at night. All right, so the next class of blood pressure and lowering drugs is called ACE inhibitors. These drugs usually end in pril, like lisinopril, enalapril, captopril, and the purpose of these is to prevent remodeling. Now, remodeling is essentially scar tissue. After the MI, the patient's heart becomes damaged. The tissue eventually has to rebuild itself. Now, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be as stretchy. Just like when you get a scar, when you get a cut, that skin isn't the same, it's not as stretchy. Well, the heart tissue isn't going to be as stretchy e either, and this is called remodeling. 
Now, what ACE inhibitors do is they prevent remodeling. So how these drugs lower blood pressure is by stopping angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Vasoconstriction just means it squeezes vessels. When you squeeze a vessel that's pumping out blood, the pressure that's being pumped out goes up. That's what angiotensin II does. So where does angiotensin II come from? It comes from angiotensin I. Angiotensin I gets turned into angiotensin II through an angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE inhibitors prevent angiotensin I from turning into angiotensin II. It does this by inhibiting the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE. Now, if you didn't understand that, don't worry about it. Just know that it stops A1 from turning into A2. Now, the side effect of ACE inhibitors is going to be a dry cough. When this happens, call the doctor to change the meds. The other thing that can happen is something called angioedema, and this is an emergency. Angioedema means facial swelling. So why are we worried about the face swelling? Because we're worried about the airway swelling. We're worried the patient's not going to be able to breathe. The last thing you need to know is to teach the patients not to eat any salt substitutes. This is because ACE inhibitors prevent the patient from excreting potassium. Salt substitutes are essentially potassium. Instead of the salt shaker being sodium chloride, it's potassium chloride. The next class of drugs that lower blood pressure and then LOL, like metoprolol, carvedilol, propanolol. The purpose of these drugs are is to stop angina or chest pain by reducing the amount of cardiac workload. They do these by blocking epinephrine. Epinephrine raises blood pressure and heart rate, and that's what these drugs try to stop. Aside from lowering blood pressure and heart rate, the side effect of these drugs is bronchospasm. That's a fancy way of saying an asthma attack. So make sure you don't give these to any patient that has asthma. The other thing that these drugs can do is mask hypoglycemic signs and symptoms. Now, hypoglycemic symptoms are actually caused by an increase in epinephrine. Because these drugs block epinephrine, they also block the hypoglycemic symptoms. Before we talk about the next antihypertensive, you need to know about calcium and the heart. Calcium makes the heart work harder. It makes it contract more strongly. This means calcium causes blood pressure and heart rate to go up. So what calcium channel blockers do is they prevent calcium from entering the muscle, which then relaxes the blood vessels, relaxes the heart, and it lowers blood pressure and heart rate. So some of the calcium channel blockers that you need to know include nifedipine. There's also amlodipine. Note how they both end in dipine. Then there's also dibteozam and verapamil. These stop angina, stop chest pain. And there's one contraindication, meaning someone who can't take it, and that's anyone with heart failure. The side effect of these drugs is fatigue and constipation. I like to call these drugs the I don't give a shit pill, because I don't give a shit mentally, which is fatigue, and I don't give a shit physically, constipation. The only other side effect is peripheral edema. The last category of drugs I want to talk about is called ARBs, or angiotensin II receptor blockers. This includes lorsartan and valsartan. Look how they end in sartan. Now, these are used if ACE inhibitors are not an option. The side effects are the same as ACE inhibitors. The teaching is the same as ACE inhibitors. The last drug I want to talk about is called nitroprusside. This is a really potent antihypertensive where you have to monitor the blood pressures every five minutes. This drug metabolizes into cyanide, so you've got to make sure the patient has good kidney function in order to excrete it. How do you know if the patient has good kidney function? You check BUN and creatinine. These are your kidney labs. Normal BUN should be 10 to 20, and normal creatinine is 1. If it's more than that, that means your kidneys aren't working as well. Alright guys, that's everything you need for cardiac meds.